This afternoon, we will have two distinguished speakers making presentations, and I'd like to introduce you to the first one. Professor Joseph L. Graves, Jr. is an Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Biological Sciences at the Joint School of Nanoengineering, I'm sorry, Nanosciences and Nanoengineering at North Carolina A&T State University, that's a lot, and at UNC at Greensboro. His research concerns the evolutionary genetics of postponed aging and biological concepts of race in humans, with over 70 papers and book chapters published. He has appeared in six documentary films and numerous television interviews on these general topics. His books on the biology of race are entitled The Emperor's New Clothes, Biological Theories of Race at the Millennium, The Race Myth, Why We Pretend Race Exists in America. Please welcome Professor Graves. I was warned that I needed to know how much time. Well, we shall try to use it efficaciously. All right, so you already know who I am. You know the title of this talk, so we're not going to bother with that slide. You also know the title of my two books on this general topic. And not to plug myself, but I'll be signing copies for any of you who are interested after this talk. So let me talk about some resources that you may not know. Um, these include a website called Race, Are We So Different? that came out in conjunction with the film um, Race, Power of an Illusion, which is now a little bit dated with regard to the genetics portion. Um, the film was actually made before the publication of the Human Genome Project. <clears throat> However, all of the work um, in human genetics since that time has actually further reified everything we said about biological variation within the human species in that film. Now, another resource that you may not be aware of is the Encyclopedia of Race and Racism. Now, I was the editor for all of the evolution, genetics, and anthropology articles in that volume. So if your library does not have it, you should, because it is really one of the most authoritative general reference works on subjects related to race and racism that currently exists in the world. All right, now, today's talk is going to follow two articles that I recently published, uh, one in the Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, and the other um, in a special volume of American Behavioral Sciences. So as I have shouted more than enough times, no justice, no peace. If we are truly concerned about living in a world that is peaceful, that respects the rights of all of its inhabitants, then we must forever dismantle the notions, the core notions that reside behind racism. Racism has been a tool of virtually every authoritarian, totalitarian regime in the history of the modern world. I give some examples here. One of them you might not recognize as a totalitarian, authoritarian regime, and that's the one in the center top of this slide. That happens to be pictures taken from a public lynching that occurred in Marion, Indiana in 1930. People who live in the United States, at least those of European descent, like to think of this country as being a bastion of democracy and human rights. I am sorry, that is not the experience 
that I and my ancestors have experienced in this country. Okay, the lynchings continue, some sanctioned by law and law enforcement. And these all can be laid at the doorstep of beliefs about race that are as fundamental in American social life as the belief, as I say to my students, in gravity. Now, unfortunately, the scientific basis for the notion of biological races within the human species cannot be in any way compared to the scientific evidence for physical phenomena such as gravity. So to understand that, we need to look at the history of how we came to believe that biological races exist within the human species. This, by the way, was not something that humans always believed. It really resides within the time period of the European voyages of dis so-called discovery, which I call the Euro European voyages of colonialism, as an ideology to justify the denial of human rights to people who were not the same as themselves. But even within this time period, there were people of good faith who recognized the falseness of these assertions. One of them, who you might be surprised to know, was a young biologist who took ship aboard HMS Beagle in the 1830s. He wrote in his diary of the voyage of the Beagle, it is often attempted to palliate slavery by comparing the state of the slaves with our poorer countrymen. If the misery of the poor be caused not by the laws of nature, but by our institutions, great is our sin. Now, I'm going to discuss a phenomenon known as biological determinism. Biological determinism rests on the assumption that there is a simple relationship between the inherent biologic genetic features of human beings and their position in society. And this is really what Darwin was speaking of in his oft-quoted, great is our sin. In racist biological determinism, because there, there are many sorts, including biological determinism of gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. But in racist biological determinism, the relevant biologic feature is the purported race of the persons in question. While biological determinism is ancient, racist biological determinism dates as I said, from the periods of the voyages of discovery. This ideology played a key role in the subjugation of millions of people. Now, I have divided the period of biological determinism into two. The first actually residing within the bounds of religious thought. So this is what I call creationist narratives of biological determinism. So these begin very early on in the period I mentioned. For example, the French physician, sorry, the Swiss physician, Paracelsus claimed that the children of Adam only inhabited a small portion of the earth. And therefore he came up with the notion of the pre-Adamite races, that Africans and other dark-skinned people were the descendants of Cain while Europeans were the descendants of Abel. Later on, in 1591, Giordano Bruno, who may be remembered by members of the audience for his defense of the Copernican universe, actually claimed that no reasonable person could believe that Ethiopians had the same ancestry as the Jews. Therefore, God must have created separate atoms. Africans, therefore, descended from the pre-Adamite races. Bruno was burned at the stake for this heresy, as well as for his defense of the Copernican universe during the Inquisition in 1600. Now, a couple of centuries later, 
One of the most popular books in the United States was a book by a, po a writer named Josiah Priest, and it was entitled Bible Defense of Slavery. In it, he used Noah's curse as the chief argument for the origin inferiority of the Negro race. This was essentially what's called a monogenic argument in which there was one atom and darker skinned people of the earth were the result of some degeneration which in priest's mind occurred because of Noah's curse against uh, Ham. Now, at the same time, the popular scientific view concerning Africans and other non-Europeans were that they were the result of separate creations, in other words, pre-Adamite races. And the four most prominent scientists involved in this, who I have named the four horsemen of polygeny, were Samuel G. Morton, Josiah Knott, George R. Glidden, and Luis Agassiz. They advocated various forms of pre-atomism in both anthropological and archaeological journals. Now, Agassiz was considered their chief theoretician. He was, again, Swiss-born. He came to the United States. He observed African slaves or enslaved African people and felt that they could not have been descendants of the same Adam and came up with his theory of the zones of creation. Uh, Samuel R. Morton, or Samuel G. Morton, sorry, was considered one of America's greatest men of science. He was a uh, researcher at the Philadelphia College of Medicine. He measured skulls, and this episode is well described in Stephen Jay Gould's uh, immortal work, The Mismeasure of Man, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today. Josiah Knott was a South Carolina physician, and George R. Glidden was the son of an English businessman. And they were the chief propagandists of polygeny, and their major work was called Types of Mankind in 1854 and Indigenous Races of the Earth in 1857. Now, Knott was acclaimed throughout the South for his lectures on, quote, Negrology, which were used by the slaveholders to justify the enslavement of Africans. Now, in the 19th century, the naturalists of this time period agreed on the idea that Africans were, in fact, separate species from Europeans. And this is given here in a uh, table from my work. And you can see that this view is held by scientists in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in France as well. They looked at physical traits of Africans, compared them to Europeans, generally found them to be inferior, um, were in agreement about whether the traits were inheritable or genetic, and in agreement that they weren't, for the most part, caused by environment, and that these, in fact, represented the traits of separate species. Now, in 1859, when Darwin published On the Origin of Species, he purposely did not talk about humans. He understood that his work was going to be controversial enough without having the extra bone of contention of the human species. So he talked about um, pigeons, he talked about um, finches, talked about a whole bunch of things, didn't talk about people. But by 1871, Charles Darwin was the leading person in British science. He no longer had the professional concerns that he dealt with in 1859, and then he decided to deal with the human species in a work called The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. In this work, Darwin pointed out that human races were probably not real. And what he meant by that was that depending upon the traits the naturalists of his time used, they had identified between two and 63 human races. Now, this was because there was no a priori reason why anyone would choose those specific traits to be representative of the human species and therefore valuable as sources of taxonomy or taxonomic reasoning. So he thought that human races were protean or polymorphic, and he recognized that the physical differences used by naturalists to define these human races could not have been of significance. 
because if they were, they would have been removed by natural selection a long time ago. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with population genetics, this is an amazing piece of insight by Darwin, considering he did not have the theory of genetics, which was later developed by Greg, or was developed by Gregor Mendel around the same time, but later incorporated into Darwinian theory in the 1930s. So he recognized that these traits, for the most part, were probably neutral. And if they were neutral, they would not have been acted upon by natural selection, and therefore no means by which to define races. So this now leads us to the 21st century. So the problem that I find in my work, um, and I've given this talk literally around the world, but in the United States in particular, Americans routinely conflate socially defined and biological conceptions of race. They are not the same thing. And I'm going to demonstrate to, that to you in short order. Scholars from the humanities to the biological sciences disagree on their definitions and therefore add to this confusion. So, Because of this, we now reside in a period that I, I and others have entitled neo-racism. Neo-racists often argue that because our species doesn't have or display biological races, racism therefore cannot exist. This confusion, of course, results from the fact that they're really talking about socially defined racial groups, not biological ones. Trayvon Martin, as an example, was not killed because of the state of this or that genetic polymorphism in his genome, but rather he was killed due to deeply held social stereotypes that reside in our psyche around socially defined race. One example of the phenomena, or, or, or that gives evidence to this phenomenon, is the dramatic increases in incarceration which have occurred over the 20th century. So, it would surprise, it may not surprise this group, but it would surprise many people to know that in 1933, during the height of Jim Crow, which was an explicitly racial system, that the ratio of African Americans incarcerated compared to European Americans was three to one. However, in 1950, that ratio became four to one. In 1960, five to one. 1970, six to one. 1989, seven to one. And 2008, 7.07 to one. Now, you could explain this increase in incarceration under the Jim Crow period. But after Jim Crow, de jure Jim Crow had been dismantled, it's hard to understand how these e increases could occur. And most certainly, it is impossible to understand this by changes in the genetic composition of the African American population, which, by the way, some scholars have claimed. Now, another example of this long-standing institutional racism in the United States are the mortality ratios from all biological sources which are observed in the African American population compared to the European American population. Now the data you see here looks at mortality ratio from two sources of death, cancer and heart disease for European American and African American males in blue and European and African American females in pink. The solid line represents the identity ratio. In other words, if the rates were equal, and this is an age-specific rate, then all of these graphs would reside along that solid line. But what we see here is ratios that go from 5.5 in cancer down to identity at the latest age and 3 or 2.5 for males down to identity. 
Now, this is a very crucial statistic when you understand, and, and it's going to become more crucial as I th show more data. So here we have an example of mortality rates from a non-biologic source, homicide. This is for, again, African-American males in blue and African-American females in pink. And one of the most shocking piece of data on this graph is looking at the homicide rate for young African-American girls at age 15. It's 60 times that of European-American girls at the same age. Now, this is one of these things which, again, you know, elephant in the living room sort of phenomenon, but yet I doubt most people have heard these numbers before today. Yet, this sort of disparity should be the central topic of conversation in a society that was really concerned with racial justice. And it is not. Now, these data indicate that even in the 21st century, socially defined racial groups experience different social, health, and mortality profiles in the United States. It is also reasonable to believe that differentials in complex disease and behavior are driven, or sorry, I should have said, it is not reasonable to believe that differentials in complex disease and behavior are driven primarily by genetic polymorphisms. So, however, some people are saying this, quote, while race itself is not a biological variable, groups that identify as a given race may share biologic characteristics that originated as a result of shared ancestry. Now, the assumption this researcher is making is that African ancestry predisposes one to greater disease and mortality profiles in the United States. And this is what I have termed the myth of the genetically sick African. In other words, these disease profiles are not the result of environmental conditions that people are forced to live under. They're the result of some innate problem in the African American genome, which I'm now going to demonstrate cannot be supported theoretically nor by any sort of empirical measure of the genetic composition of these groups. So, now I approach this from the viewpoint of someone who studies evolutionary medicine. And what I mean by that is we can ask the question, especially guided by evolutionary mechanisms which account for disease in any species. And this is one of the things that Darwin pointed out in The Descent of Man, that we should treat humans the way we treat any other species. We shouldn't have any special biological approach for humans that we wouldn't use in any other species. So we can ask the question whether it is reasonable for a particular um, group of people to have genetic predispositions that could account for the sort of health disparities we see in U.S. society. Note that this is a different question than the standing assumption of what's been called racial medicine. Racial medicine assumes that races exist in the human species. It assumes that races differ by their genetic composition and that these, and most crucially, these genetic variants account for the observed health differentials. So it may be true that number one is correct. I would argue no, but let's assume it is for a second. And then two, it is definitely true that there is geographically based genetic variation in the human species. But the real question is number three. Does that genetic variation actually account for the observed health differentials that we see, and that's where I say emphatically no. So, the primary sources of mortality and morbidity in Western industrialized nations are heart disease and cancer. Now, these are not derived from single genes. And oftentimes, when you hear discussions of genetics in the media, they'll talk about the gene for heart disease, the gene for cancer, the gene for schizophrenia. And the simple fact is none of these diseases are the result of a single gene. They're what we call complex genetic phenomena. And this means that they are different from diseases like sickle cell anemia, which can be accounted for by a single gene of high penetrance. Now, 
It makes no sense, therefore, to characterize health disparities in as resulting from diseases such as sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, progeria, or Crohn's disease. These are single gene diseases. They are not the same as the complex diseases like heart disease and cancer. The frequency of those genes, the ones that I just mentioned, are caused from the population's history, something we call genetic drift, and driven by another factor in population genetics called mutation selection balance, and hence, therefore, must be rare. So it's entirely possible that different populations around the world will differ in their frequencies of things like Crohn's disease because it is simply the result of a roll of the dice. That is not going to be the same as a disease like cancer, which is caused by many genes across the genome. So what you see here is age-specific mortality across several years in the 20th century for African Americans compared to European Americans for 24 known biological sources of death. And these data show, again, 2.5 to 2 being the ratio until the latest age. So this begs the question, does racial medicine make sense? So I argue that this is even more absurd to believe this when we look at genome-wide studies that show that Europeans actually have a greater load of deleterious mutations than Africans do. Now, let me explain to you how we know that a mutation is deleterious, meaning bad. Okay. In molecular genetics, we have something called the dogma, which is DNA codes for RNA, which codes for protein. The DNA code consists of three nucleotides. You know the nucleotides. A for added adenosine, T for thymine, C for cytosine, and G for guanine. A, T, C, G. You take a group of three of those and they code for an amino acid. We can determine by where the mutation occurs in the triplet code whether that mutation is neutral meaning has no effect on the resulting protein, or whether it is bad. Now, the vast majority of mutations are actually bad. And so we can look across the genome, as Low Miller and their colleagues did in 2008, and we can score for the presence of bad mutations. And they did this. And Europeans had mad, more bad mutations in their genome than Africans did. Now. Understanding human population history also explains why this is true. Our species, anatomically modern humans, originated in Africa around 200,000 years ago. We stayed in Africa for at least 100,000 years before anyone left. So for the first 100,000 years of human history, all members of our species, anatomically modern humans, lived in a small region of Eastern Africa. When people began to leave, when changes in the last glaciation changed seafloor levels, they left in small groups. So that means that the groups that left could not have taken the vast majority of the genetic variation that existed in the human species with them. This is what we call genetic drift. And as such, more likely that you get, by chance alone, more of the deleterious ones than you do the good ones, just because there are far more bad ones than there are good ones. So not surprising, considering that if we look at the human species today, 85% of the genetic variation in our species anatomically modern humans, is found in sub-Saharan Africans. That means that if an asteroid hit the Earth tomorrow and wiped out all regions of the world except sub-Saharan Africa, 85% of the genetic variation of our species would still be here. Okay? And that's because the people who left 
had a shorter period to accumulate new mutations compared to the people who stayed. Okay. So this, of course, raises the question, if Africans in the African genome is more diverse and generally is healthier, why are so many African Americans living with so much disease and why are so many European Americans living relatively healthy compared to that group? And so I would argue that this is best explained not by genetics, but by environment. So here we have an example of mortality ratio by household income. And for those of you who are lucky enough to be here on Wednesday night, you had a chance to see Professor Carter show you data on household income by socially defined race in the United States. And so unfortunately, because of our history, socially defined race and household income are closely tied variables. And so the people who have the least household income in this data are the ones that have the highest mortality rates. And I hate to say it, but the numbers look awfully familiar. I showed you a slide of biologic mortality for African Americans, and the ratios were between 2.5 to 2. Well, here we have for 20,000 and under, 3. For 20,000, 2.49. For 30,000, 2. So given the connectedness of household income to socially defined race in the United States, these numbers are by no means surprising. So, in, you know, I'm not going to read this slide because actually Dr. Carter did, but the long and short of this is household income in the United States differs by socially defined race. So go on to the next one. Okay. Now, you might want to ask the question, how does social subordination actually get under the skin? Well, a very interesting study came out in 2004 which showed accelerated telomere shortening in response to life stress. In this study, researchers looked at telomeres which are biomarkers of aging. And the study examined the telomere lengths of 58 healthy premenopausal women who had either a healthy child or those who were giving care to a chronically ill child. They measured perceived stress, years of caregiving, telomere length, and oxidative stress. They found statistically higher differences in telomere length between women taking care of chronically ill children. In other words, their telomere lengths were shorter and those who had healthy children. They also found highly statistically significant negative correlations between telomere length and perceived stress and years of caregiving. So this enzyme known as telomerase activity was highly statistically significantly negatively correlated with perceived stress and years of caregiving as well. Finally, oxidative stress was highly correlated, positively correlated with perceived stress and years of caregiving. They concluded that the telomere length shortening was equivalent to 9 to 17 years of aging for the women in the high stress group. Now, when I saw this paper in 2004, my first response was that any group that is socially subordinated and living with prolonged life stress should show the same sorts of results. Not surprisingly, assuming this machine wants to work, there we go. This is exactly how racial manif subordination manifests itself. A similar study in 2014 looked at discrimination, racial bias, and telomere length in African American men. They found that after controlling for chronological age, socioeconomic and health-related characteristics and racial discrimination and implicit racial bias were strongly related to telomere length. This means that the more a person has perceived that they have been discriminated against, 
the greater their rate of cellular aging as measured by telomere length. Worse, still the more the person believes that the discrimination is justified, that is the implicit bias, the greater their rate of cellular aging. So we have long heard in psychology that the internalization of impression leads to negative health outcomes. Now we have a mechanism which is consistent with that result. So, now this leaves us again in contradiction to the claims of racial medicine. We simply do not require racial medicine to make sense of health disparity. Racial medicine asserts that we can reliably predict an individual's disease predisposition by determining their biological race. If this syllogism were true, then I think the utility would be obvious. For example, we would be able to develop a number of race-specific therapies. This would allow pharmaceutical companies to market specific drugs that target specific races. So in other words, we would medicalize the treatment for social oppression. Now, I don't know about you guys, but from where I'm standing, I don't think that that's a good way to go about things. But one company did. Okay, and that company was called NitroMed. And even though a number of us went to Capitol Hill and testified that Bidil could not possibly be a racial medicine, it was still approved for use and prescription to only persons of African American descent. Now, funny enough, Bidil actually failed because persons of African American descent in the main did not want to take a drug that was tailored solely for African Americans. And so eventually the drug was taken off the market. So now, what is the ideological utility of racial medicine? Well, one way it can be useful is that something that is a weakness can become a strength. So consider the following argument. The higher prevalence of lysosomal diseases amongst the Ashkenazim resulted from past natural selection for intelligence that was necessary for their economic survival in feudal Europe. Now, yes, this was actually published by a group of researchers in 2006. Now, I call this a just-so story. It requires that there is a mechanistic link between lysosomal disease and greater intelligence. It requires that there's a link between greater intelligence and differential economic well-being. It requires that there's a link between economic well-being and differential reproductive success. Okay, now that one in the Middle Ages might have been true. In other words, people who had more, ate more, and probably were more fertile. But the other two, it's not so clear that they were true. Another ideological utility of racial medicine is that a strength can become a weakness. So let's consider the salt hypertension hypothesis. During the Middle Passage, Africans who had a greater ability to retain salt had a higher likelihood of survival. The descendants in a society with excess salt now have a predisposition to hypertension greater than that of other racial ethnic groups. Now, there are a number of assumptions here, okay? Number one, these researchers assumed that Western Africans didn't have salt. Now, how people who lived on the seashore could not figure out how to get salt from an ocean with salt water in it, I fail to understand. In fact, there was a bustling trade in salt in Africa from the coast to the interior. So all of these people had access to salt, okay? The next assumption is that during slave voyages, that death from um, heat exhaustion was the primary cause of death in slave cargoes. From the records we have of slave cargoes, and we have extensive medical records from slave cargoes, the primary cause of death was actually pneumonia, okay? lung infection, not heat exhaustion. So that wasn't necessarily true. And finally, even if we assume that all of that were true, we're taking tropical Africans 
and moving them to a subtropical climate. Why would they be more likely to develop salt retaining mechanisms compared to northern temperate Europeans coming from a cold, sunless environment in northwest Europe coming to a subtropical environment in the Virginia and Carolinas. If I were going to make an argument for natural selection promoting salt retention, I'd make it for the Europeans. I wouldn't make it for the Africans. So there's no reason to believe any of this. So finally, this is the question that I haven't answered and will answer now. What exactly do we mean by race to begin with? Well, there are basically two conceptions. Biological conceptions of race, which have morphed between physical traits or morphology to geographical location, to population base, that is the frequency of genes, and now using modern techniques to what we call cladistic analysis, that is, the determination of which group is more closely related to another. Whereas socially defined race arbitrarily utilizes aspects of morphology, what people look like, geography, culture, language, religion, but always does so in the service of a social dominance hierarchy. These systems never exist in absence of social dominance. And they differ depending upon the nature of the social dominance. So for example, in Brazil, there are at least 13 categories of individuals of African descent. And to Brazilians, these categories are as real as the categories that exist in the United States. If you call a Moreno a Clara in Brazil, you could have a fight on your hands. But we would look, Americans would look at these people and say that they're all African or black. But their categories are different because Brazil has a different history. When we look at biological criteria for race, they actually fail in humans. And the two criteria which biologists use for any species are the amount of variation within and between groups and whether we can identify unique genetic lineages. So if you can excuse me for the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna get a little technical, okay? So we actually have a way to test this. Um, the American geneticist Sewell Wright developed uh, measures of genetic variation, which he called his F statistics. These allow us to determine how much or what sorts of differences exist between subpopulations and the entire species. So in our case, we would consider our subpopulations Europeans, Africans, East Asians, Pacific Islanders, Amer Indians as particular examples. Now, we can measure a statistic that we call FST. That is the amount of subdivision between the subgroups and the total population. This is determined by the, oh, I hate to do this. Um, this is determined by the heterozygosity of the total population. Heterozygosity refers to the fact that organisms like ourselves have biparental inheritance. We get one set of genes from our mother, one set of genes from our father. If the genes are the same, a person is called homozygous. If the genes are different, they're called heterozygous. So we can measure that for the total population, subtract that from the heterozygosity of the subpopulations, and divide it by the total. This becomes a decimal number between zero and one. Now, the threshold for the determination of the existence of a biological race within a species is the number 0 0.250, or about one quarter. Now, Wright did not choose this number arbitrarily. At this value, there's a significant chance that different genes occur in the populations in question. And the way we would define whether races exist is by the number of different genes that exist in the different groups. Does that idea make sense to you all? 
Now, we've actually measured this for a variety of species. That's what I'm about to show you now. All right, so you see a bunch of horizontal bars, I'm sorry, vertical bars behind me. Which one do you think refers to humans? Anyone want to take a wild guess? Okay, the axes on the x-axis are the names of the different species. On the y-axis are the values of the FST statistic. So, um, the value for our species is in black for anatomically modern humans based upon 24 medically relevant genes. That value is 0 0.156. And that does not exceed 0 0.250. There are species that do. So for African wildebeest, for gray wolves, for Grant's gazelle, those are species that have biological races. Those are the ones towards what would be the left of the screen for you, okay? Or the right of the screen for you. And so when people say there's no such thing as race, I tell them that's not true. I've been quoted as saying there's no such thing as race. I've never said that. What I have said over and over again is that there are no biological races in the human species. And how would I know whether there are no biological races in the human species if there weren't species in which biological races exist? We just don't happen to be one of them. Now, okay, and I'm going to just show you an example of what I'm talking about because I know I'm coming close to the end. All right, so assuming this thing is going to work. Okay, so here's an example of what I'm talking about. So what you see here, and uh, I don't have a pointer, so maybe I'll go over here and point from East Africa all the way over to the Americas. Now, what would you see if we really had biological races? We wouldn't see this continual cluster. We would see gaps. We would see places where groups clustered together but were separated from other groups. But you don't see that. What you see is continuous human variation. So any attempt to try to draw boundaries between these groups is entirely arbitrary. And so we can do that with more sophisticated measures. So we now have whole genome sequencing, which allows us to look at entire genomes and to determine which genomes look more like each other. This printout here, this picture, is from a computer algorithm called Structure. And with Structure, you can tell it how many groups you want or you can have it calculate the groups using maximum likelihood statistics. So what this paper shows us is that depending upon the number of clusters you want, you can have any number of clusters going from 14 to two. And each one of these simulations, by the way, is statistically significant. So it's just as meaningful, I could say, that there are two great human races centered on Western Africa going all the way over to Asia. So that would mean Europeans and Africans would be in the same race. And East Asians would be the other race. Or I could have three races. Or I could have 14. And since they're all statistically significant, any group that you choose becomes arbitrary. For example, using structure, I can define all those different racial groups in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. And everybody else would be the other race. Which, Wayne, again, what does genetic variation tell us? Well, this is what it tells us. Our species, anatomically modern humans, are young species with very little genetic variation. Would you like to know how little 
we have less genetic variation than one tribe of Western African chimpanzees. Okay? All persons alive today are descended from persons who lived in Africa between 150,000 to 70,000 years ago. Some people are descended from persons who left Africa and adapted to their local conditions. For example, the blue eye gene is only 6,000 years old. Okay, it occurred in Northern Europe as a mutation 6,000 years ago. There are two genes for blonde hair, one that appears in Northern Europe and one that appears in Melanesia. Both groups have blonde hair, but they have different genes. None of these adaptations would justify classifying humans into biological races. So here's the punchline. Our socially defined races do not match biological variation. Socially defined races are arbitrary and are the product of social antagonisms. People should not believe that innate or genetically determined racial differences are responsible for the pattern of individuals within any society. So finally, if genes cannot explain why groups are subordinated, then it follows that we must look to our social practices. And in this case, I speak of institutional racism to explain the patterns of inequality. This explains why we cannot have biological races, but we can still have racism operating in our societies against socially defined groups. So, again, no justice, no peace.